Professor Theriault, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Matthew. Why don't we start with your background? You know, where'd you come from? So the arc of your career so far and where you are now? Sure. So I, I grew up in Michigan, uh, spent the first 18 years of my life there, and then I headed to the University of Richmond where I have a uh, BA. Um, and after that, I went to Capitol Hill and I worked on Capitol Hill for a year at the uh, Office of the Legislative Council. Um, so those are the 40 or so attorneys that actually put ideas into legal language. Um, and all I did for them was answer the phone. Um, and after being in politics for a year, I decided that I didn't like politics as much as I thought I did. Um, but I love the study of it. So I went back and I got a master's at the University of Rochester, a PhD at Stanford. And I've now been at the University of Texas for almost 20 years. Right. And are you, are you there now? I, I think you have a secondary appointment of some kind, correct? Yeah, that's right. So uh, this semester, I'm at the Library of Congress as a Kluge Fellow. Um, and so I'm working on a project here. Uh, and it's, it's been great being a, uh, across the street from the U.S. Capitol. Excellent. And so what did you focus on during your Ph.D. study? Right. So my Ph.D. looked at uh, the power of the people and, and how they were able to um, convince members of Congress to do things that maybe they didn't want to do. So I looked at issues like campaign finance reform, congressional pay, um, in uh, civil service reform to figure out when it is that members of Congress can get away with feathering their own nests and when it is that the public rises up and, and makes them adhere to the public's uh, wishes. Um, and so in short, I find that congressional competition and, and public attention are the two critical details that will indicate whether or not members of Congress are able to get away with things or whether or not the public will rise up and, and make them pay a price for doing so. Interesting. And so, you know, that kind of goes to that principal agent uh, fundamental question economics. And so you tackle yeah. that directly in your dissertation. That's that's quite interesting. Right, because I, the easy things are looking at, right, members from rural districts that they support agricultural subsidies. I mean, and to me, those weren't necessarily interesting. What was interesting to me was those questions where, they want to do something, but their constituents find them to do something else. And when they're confronted with that, like who ends up winning the battle inside the member's head as to dictating the, the, the behavior. And so how about your time at the Office of the Legislative Council? I think that's an area that a lot of people don't quite understand. Uh, you said you were just working the phones there, but did you, get, did you pick up any kind of understanding of how that institution worked or what kind of workflow they had, what challenges they had? Yeah, Matthew, for sure I did. I mean, I think I, I've always been interested in politics because I'm interested in personalities. But what I really uh, enjoyed about that office was the institutional focus. Um, and I was there during the Clinton healthcare, right? So I was there in 1993, 94. Um, and so just seeing the way that member staff and leadership staff and committee staff and then the White House and, and all those principals were meeting in our office on a daily basis. Um, and the fascinating thing about that office is that during the morning, they would be meeting with the Democrats trying to craft a policy. And then during the afternoon, they're meeting with the Republicans trying to figure out how to tear down the policy that the Democrats were, were trying to come up with. And so just having that perspective um, and watching those different sorts of folks come through the doorway was just really foundational for how it is that I think about Congress as an institution um, and how it is that I study Congress at the end of the day. Fantastic. So let's talk about your, your kind of broad areas of interest. Obviously, you, you said you're, you're interested in politics and the study of it. What are your kind of general themes when it comes to your work? What, what, are, what are the big, the larger kind of uh, questions that you like that you want to you, you want to address through your research? Yeah, so, so the way that I think about it is any institution, right? We can talk about Congress. I have the side interest in, in the politics of the Catholic Church um, in, in both things, right? Sometimes I say I study dysfunctional institutions. <laughs> um, another way of thinking about it is that both of those people have individuals within them, but they have institutional frameworks. And so I'm really interested in the way that the institutional framework can then um, uh, restrict, modify, compel behavior that we wouldn't think that, that people otherwise would necessarily engage in. So I like thinking about institutional structures and, and how those might be changed in order to elicit different types of behavior that we might uh, deem more appropriate, perhaps, than, than the things that we see coming out of either Congress or the Catholic Church these days. Great. Well, let's talk about then some of the specific questions you're looking at within that, that broader context. I know you have a, a book on this concept of the broadening. Can you explain through that, you know, what, what were the fundamental questions you were you know, grappling with and did you find any interesting answers to them? Yeah. So the, the, the kind of the question driving the whole research was that, that people always wanted to talk about the, how the government was getting bigger, um, right? How they were spending more money. Um, in, 
in, in, in fact, they are, right? There's no doubt that trend line is, is going up, but we found that to be a much less interesting trend than the areas in which the federal government was starting to act. Um, and so uh, what, there's a pre-existing, the policy agenda project coding scheme that has 21 major topics, 225 minor topics. And so what we trace in, in a really broad way is, is when is it that the federal government starts getting involved in all those separate areas? Um, and so we document that, that the great broadening happens, and this is really from the 1950s until the late 1970s, in that the federal government is getting involved in lots of different things. And then starting at the late 1970s, there's one of two different uh, uh, trends that, that, the, that the data follow. So in some regards, uh, then the number of, of minor topics that the government's involved in starts shrinking. Um, so uh, if we look at bill introductions or if we look at laws, both of those areas are that Congress is enacting fewer laws and in, in fewer uh, areas than they were during the 1950s and 1970s. But if we look at other things such as where are they holding oversight hearings, we still see Congress being involved in all of those major topics that they had encroached on uh, from the 1950s to the 1970s. Um, and we ultimately argue in the book that it's really the great broadening rather than the growth in government that is creating all sorts of change uh, in our political systems. So this is in part the reason why we have more oversight hearings today than we have legislative referral hearings, or the reason that today bills that are passed in Congress are much bigger and are far fewer of them, right? The, the, the rise of the omnibus bills, right? We, we also trace uh, the rise of interest groups, Right? So it's not that there's an, an increase in the broadening of interest groups in Washington, D.C., but rather the pattern that we find is that Congress starts getting involved in more areas of, of law. And then as a consequence of Congress getting involved in those areas, then interest groups start forming um, around uh, Congress's increasing involvement in those in those minor topic areas. Um, and so it 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 it. it um, Kind of reorients the 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 world that we're now living in. So right. So when uh, Ronald Reagan comes into power in the 1980s, when the Republicans become a majority in Congress in the mid 1990s, then what is it that the conservatives who want to be involved in less areas of law? How is it that they manage this greatly broadened federal government? Um, and so right. Sometimes we see them pulling back a little bit, and sometimes we see in other areas that they just stay uh, involved in in some of those big broad areas. So this this growth happened between or the expansion it rather happened between the 50s and the 70s. Um, you, you know, obviously, there's lots of people who talk about why that happened. Do you have a perspective on it? Yeah, so I would say that the, the one thing that we add that that wasn't really part of our, our original manuscript was that a lot of it has to do with what people are doing in the streets. Right. So there are a, a, a series of of, um, of protest movements happen. I mean, of course, that happens first with civil rights era. But then on, right after that, it's the women's rights and the gay rights and the environmentalism. And so each one of those kinds of uh, feeds on, on the ones that preceded it and, and, and in fact, take some of the lessons that were learned in some of those uh, um, social movements. Um, and then it uses that to then uh, expand uh, the, the scope of the federal government in, a, I think, a pretty interesting way. Um, in another kind of interesting finding that we have is it has far less to do with these crit critical elections that we think about, right? So what we find is that the great broadening starts stops happening before Ronald Reagan's elected. Right? We normally would think that, all right, 1980 was, was the big break and it's after that and we have right, the rise of Thatcherism and Reaganism and, and, and what we find is actually, right, we can pin it pretty specifically to 1978 is when the, the, the government had stopped its broadening and then we were entering a new era of, of them kind of restricting themselves in some important ways. So when you talk about this broadening concept and you're using uh, the areas in which Congress is involved as opposed to the money that it's spending. Um, are they correlated or are they in the same areas? Or are they spending all the money in one area but broadening out everywhere else? Yeah, so what we find is that the if you look at the trends of, of spending, ex except for the wars, right, it's a pretty gradual increase across time. Um, right. So it's, it's we can think of it as a secular trend rather than a big jump in, in right, any other time. And so what we find with the great broadening is, that in fact, it was really during that 20 year period that right the period before that there was minimal uh, federal government action in lots of areas. And then at the end of it, there was a lot. Um, and so what we really see is that big jump up 
Um, and we think that that does a more accurate job of explaining the fundamental transformation that we've seen and the way that the federal government does its job in, in all the various policy areas. And how does this broadening kind of play into the rights uh, discussion? Because you talked about frameworks earlier, right? And when I think about the framework of uh, the U.S. Constitution, you know, one of the key um, restrictions on what the government can do is the Bill of Rights. So you have, and, and there are typically negative rights. Um, and so this broadening would sound like it would cut against that negative right focus of, of the Constitution, um, or does it? I don't know. It, it, just, just something that comes to mind is you're talking about a broadening. In order to, to broaden, you have to do more things, which sound like they're more positive rather than negative rights. Yeah, and so right, we see it cutting kind of both ways, right? So um, whenever we start talking about the expansion of women's rights as an example, then we see that for a certain subclass of people that their rights are expanded. But inevitably, when you're expanding a certain subset of people's rights, then you're restricting other people's uh, rights and, and other institutions' ability to act. Um, and so right, what we've seen across time is that these social movements have these sorts of, of benefiting one group versus vis-a-vis -vis the other groups. Um, and so you have both at the same time, the, the positive and, and the negatives that you alluded to in the question. Well, by negatives, I mean more the, the negative rights um, as opposed to rights that require more than police action, right? That require, you know, more complicated rule sets that re require redistribution or require money. Um, and I guess you're, the key thing you're saying is that those things are disconnected from each other directly. Um, I'm not sure that there's that they're directly disconnected. Um, I think that there's a feedback loop that happens um, and, and, and then we end up in the state of the world that, that we are in now in the kind of post-1978 era. So wh why did the broadening stop then when it did? Was there some social element? There was less protests, there was higher employment, what happened? Well, so what I think what happened was the Republicans recognized that as long as they were fighting on these grounds of, of the increasing expansion of the federal government, then they were inevitably in a position that was going to disadvantage them. And so, right, we, we start seeing the Republican Party becoming much more competitive at the national level. Um, and so they start staking a claim that as long as they're fighting on the, the ground of the Democrats, then they were going to be perpetually disadvantaged. And so they started rethinking the way in which they were going to engage the Democrats. Um, and so what, what we see through the 1960s and 1970s is the Republicans, in essence, engaging in a log roll, right? So if you'll allow us to expand rights in these areas, right, we can think about policing as an example, um, then we will allow you to expand uh, the federal government in these other areas, and we could think of education. Um, but they recognized that as long as we kept talking about the expansion of the federal government into, into new areas, that, that it was at a fundamental disagreement with their underlying ideological philosophy. And so I think that there was a, a concerted effort among some and, and maybe um, fellow travelers for others, um, that unless if they started redefining the debate, um, then they were always gonna be a minority party picking up the scraps off the table. Um, and so instead they say, no, like we wanna be a national party that can compete and we're gonna try to reframe the debate so that uh, we're not always talking about uh, the areas that the government should be expanding into, but rather um, seriously questioning whether or not that's the right approach. So the, so the, uh, so the Republicans basically gave up and, and, and changed into, uh, basically decided to accept the larger government status quo and fight on those grounds? Oh, I don't, right. So I would, I'm not sure that they, they gave up in as much as they said, if we continued down the, the path that they were headed, that they would be a minority party forever. Um, and so they had to reframe the debate in order for them to ever become a majority party. And, and in fact, they, they do. And it, it, it takes, right, depending on which level of government we're talking about, it takes a while. But in, in essence, right, they, they, they win at the end of the day, or at least temporarily. Um, when we get to the right, the Gingrich era, and then of course George W. Bush, and, and even the first couple of years of Trump. And so, why didn't the broadening continue into more areas? Uh, because the Republicans stopped stopped uh, with the complicit agreement that 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 they allowed Democrats to do what they want in their areas, and Republicans would do what would want to do in their areas. And at the same time, we start getting some institutional reforms, right? So we get this idea of the subcommittee bill of rights, 
where subcommittees are going to have particular jurisdictions within the committee system. And as soon as you do that and you name a Republican ranking member to that particular area, then they have a greater stake in making sure that the, the conservative ideological philosophy is followed in that area rather than trying to figure out how they can go along to get along with, with the Democrat uh, member, of, with the chair of either the subcommittee or the, or the committee. Um, and so, Right, there's there's a, a fundamental fundamental redefinition of how the parties uh, acted uh, uh, against each other um, at, at the height of the Great Broadening. Hmm. So th- I guess this brings up one of your other um, you know, themes in your work, which is this, uh, and I think you you wrote a book on the the Gingrich senators uh, that that I guess uh, le- learned a certain culture in the House and then brought it to the Senate. Can you can you talk about your your, your work in that area and as it relates to the culture of the institution, as it relates to behavior in the institution, uh, which seems to be a little bit together what we just discussed. Can you talk about the questions you had there and what did you find? Yeah, and so the, the question really at the heart of that research was, why was it that the Senate was as polarized as the House? Um, when we think about polarization, we think, all right, so, so maybe it has something to do with uh, a majoritarian institution, right? As soon as you only need, uh, 50% of the members to go along with it, then, then they can kind of screw the other side in a much more direct way. Or we could think about redistricting, right? So as long as we're creating these districts and that were purposefully created to elect a liberal Democrat or conservative Republican, then we would have increased polarization. And so all of those explanations work really well in the House. They don't work at all in the Senate. Right? So the Senate has always been a super majoritarian institution. Right? To change the rules is really difficult. It requires more than just a majority party enacting its will. Right? States don't go through rejiggering their borders trying to figure out who senators are. Um, and so it, it was a puzzle. Like, so why, when we look at a lot of the different polarization measures, why does it appear that the Senate is just as polarized as the House? Um, and so uh, through a deep dive through data and, and looking through stories, and, and I, I come up with this explanation that, that might be a little bit too cute, um, but it's this idea that, that Newt Gingrich radically transforms the way the Republican Party operates in the House of Representatives. And there are enough of the people who are serving with him that then go on to the Senate and they take those lessons that they learned in the House with Newt Gingrich, they take it over to the Senate. And as soon as, right, two, three, five, Right of them enter the Senate, and then it's twelve, and then it's fourteen, and then it's almost as, as, as half as, as as many of the Republicans in the in the Republican conference. Then they start changing the way that the Senate indeed acts as an institution. So it becomes far less of this collegial go along get along place, and in fact, it takes on some of the competitiveness um, that uh, that we saw with the with the House. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and that's really a cultural difference rather than a hard coded procedural difference uh, or anything else. It's really culture and personality driven, uh, which would probably go against the grain of, of, of most scholarship, I would assume, of the Senate. Yeah, I mean, in, 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 in here, I draw particular inspiration from Randy Strahan, right, who writes this book about agency and how much lead, how much uh, agency do do leaders have. And, and I think that the, the answer that he comes up with is that all leaders act within a particular framework, but then within that framework, within the continuum of allowable behavior, they're given a little bit of latitude. And so given the situations on the ground, given the institutional structures, um, there is still some room for agency. Um, and I'm not sure that there was ever this explicit strategy by senators that said, you know, we're, we're gonna, we aim to remake the Senate, um, except that, right, there are some people who, who truly do, right? Like, so Jim DeMint had this idea that in, instead of having a majority of Republicans, he, he mattered, it mattered to him much more that there were Republicans that truly believed in the things that they believed in. And so he is happy to be a minority party so long as the Republican Party was cohesive behind a, a common set of principles. Um, and so, right, there are enough of those types of people. And what we see is that they start having some successes. And so then success breeds upon success. And so we end up with a Senate today um, that is, is almost as polarized as the House. So for the, the Senate, which is typically, uh, you know, regarded as more of a relationships driven institution compared to the house, which we would think is more mechanical. Um, you know, I know you're doing some work in that area. Can you talk about the, the relationships aspect of it? And did that play either for or against this, this kinds of polarization? 
Yeah. And so, right, in, in, in you're alluding here to my, my current research project, which is looking at the personal relationships in this inside the Senate and in, in whether or not there truly is a decrease in what we can think of as the social fabric of the Senate. Um, and then what consequences does that reduction of the social fabric, the fraying of the social fabric, have on the way this, the Senate operates as an institution? And uh, what effect does it have on lawmaking? In, I'm midway through this project. And so at this point, I think I can say with, with a good deal of certainty that indeed the social fabric of the Senate is fraying. Um, some of the measures of the things that I'm gathering uh, indicate that there's not nearly as much cross-party collaboration as there was before. And that can be both at the legislative level and at the personal level. Um, and uh, what I haven't yet pinned down is the consequences that that has on, on either the institution or in fact lawmaking. Um, but I feel pretty confident in, in knowing that indeed the social fabric has, 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 has reduced. Um, and and I, I consider that even a, a bit of a victory. Um, I mean, the, the, the idea that, of course, the, the social fabric of the Senate is fraying, there's not a person that knows anything about the Senate that would disagree with that conclusion, but actually looking at data in, in quantifying that, the, that reduction in the social fabric, I think is, is, it, is at least a, a, a temporary victory. Like hopefully I'll have other things to say about the effect that it's ultimately had on the institution or um, on, on lawmaking itself. And the other question is what's the reason for that, that uh, decline in relationships? It, you know, is it because they're, they're never in DC, they're not doing their jobs, you know, they're not hanging out together or is it because they're not allowed to? Is it parties keeping them apart? You know, what's the, what's the cause? All of that, right? <laughs> right? So of course that has a lot to do with party leadership, but it also has a lot to do with their constituents these days, right? So uh, the Republican party more so than the Democratic party is tied to its, its polar extreme. And so these days it's really hard to survive a Republican primary if one of your talking points is that you wanna work across the aisle with Democrats to find solutions. Um, that type of campaign talking point has is, is almost non-existent. Um, I mean, on occasion, we'll hear it in the weeks before an election, but it, but it's not the governing philosophy of the senators who ultimately win. In 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 as much as it is, uh, those people are usually uh, in the Senate a, 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 for a, for a shorter duration than those who are are what I would term the party warriors who who are willing to go to the battlefield rather than try and find solutions to, to some of these major problems. And how far do you go back in your analysis of the Senate? I mean, do you go back prior to direct election of senators and see yeah. the, the difference before and after that? Because I would assume this some people might have done the same analysis at that time and come up with maybe a similar conclusion. Yeah, it's interesting, right? There's there's been good research on looking at at what direct election of senators, what kind of effect it has on the Senate. And in in the story coming out of a lot of the, that research is that it's it's tougher than 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 the argument that you lay out in in the question. Because even before we have direct election, there are lots of states that have quasi direct elections, right? So a lot of these state legislative seats become about who they are going to put up in in terms of the Senate. And so how it is that we actually actually uh, define or operationalize that independent variable to try and find the difference in the types of senators. And so at the end of the day, what we find is that the actual direct election, right, that which happens before the early part of the 20th century and that which happens after, we don't find that there's a, a really great contribution to, to a, a changing Senate, um, at least at that point. But with respect to this project, I, I mean, I think the, 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 the latest or the the um, longest data set that I have probably only goes back to the to the 19 oh maybe mid 1960s or so. Um, but but even right that Senate is pretty radically different from the Senate that operates today. Um, and of course, not all of the data sets that I'm looking at uh, can even go back that far. But even right in the last 10 years, the Senate has changed in a pretty fundamental way. So right, I'm I, I feel like I'm getting at this question brick by brick or using another analogy, right? I'm taking as many bites of the apple as I possibly can um, because it's really hard to, right? Like, I mean, I wish I could give a survey and say, how many, right, how many people on the other side of the aisle do you consider a friend? Um, but of course, those, those sorts of questions don't exist in a, in a survey database. Well, that's actually the next question I had is, you know, how do you measure the relationships uh, between senators yeah, and so what I'm what I'm involved in is is all sorts of of uh, data gathering, and and I've had lots of help with my undergraduates at the University of Texas. I've had help uh, with some of the interns here at the Li Library of Congress. Um, but maybe a, a, an easy data set for us to, uh, to analyze is looking just at senators' tweets. So 
who, so when a senator tweets, and frequently they tweet at each other, so in tweeting at each other, are they talking about their colleague in a positive way, a negative way, or a neutral way? And so just documenting those trends across time, and, and granted, we only have those as far back as senator tweets go, um, but we have other types of data sets like that. So when a senator retires, they give a, a retirement speech. Um, and then the people who serve with that senator give tribute speeches to that retiring senator. And so the longest data set I have is, is, is this one. So when a senator retires, how many people from the other side of the aisle are they talking about in the retirement speech, right? And telling fun stories about when they traveled here or there, where they're negotiating this fine uh, detail and this piece of legislation. Um, and then who are the people who are talking about that senator after the senator gives the retirement speech? And so what we see across time and in and, and here, right, I have, they're currently working on it. And so I have data going back to the 1980s now. What we find is that there are just as many in-party senators who are giving tribute speeches as there ever have been. Um, but the number of other party senators who are giving tributes to the retiring senator has decreased by half. Um, so a pretty uh, remarkable uh, trend across time. I'm also looking at senators who are willing to appear at press conferences with senators from the other side of the the aisle, right? So sometimes a, a senator just has a press conference where it's just them. Sometimes it's just their own party members, but sometimes they include other party members. Um, and so we're trying to get at, at, at those types of, of data too. Who are the senators that are willing to travel with other senators, right? So there are some senators that, tra again, travel by themselves. Some will only travel with other members of their party, uh, but some of them are still willing to go on these bipartisan CODELs. Um, and, and I think that some friendship forming happens on these CODELs. And so, um, right, how have those trends uh, changed across time as the Senate has become more polarized? And there's been talk about retreats and, you know, Codell's or whatever, you know, will your research reveal whether those actually result in stronger relationships or is it just whether they form the relationship at all at some point in their tenure together? Yeah, so the only thing that I can have at this point is looking at, at behavior that exists. Um, and so, right, is the behavior changing? And, and I could imagine some, some future project that tries to get at the, at the underlying causation of why those behavioral changes happen. Um, but I can't, I can't tackle everything at once. And so I first want to kind of put my markers in the ground um, and then we'll start asking those exact kind of questions. So do you look at co-sponsorships and things like that as part yeah. of a relationship or is that a separate issue in your mind? No, so I think the co-sponsorships are, are, are part of that story. And, and the reason I didn't mention it to you is because we have lots of people who are looking at co-sponsorships. So I'm retreading some old ground there. Um, I don't think of, of that uh, part of the, of the project as being particularly innovative versus some of these other uh, pieces of data that, that we normally wouldn't even think about gathering or, or being helpful in trying to understand the underlying social dynamic of the Senate. So when people talk about the Senate, they're always talking about the filibuster, right? Everything always goes back to the filibuster is the defining concept of the Senate versus the House, which is, you know, your majority rule. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on the filibuster in the Senate as it relates to this concept of relationships? You know, if you have stronger relationships, is that more pressure not to do a filibuster or is that more pressure to do a filibuster if you have a stronger relationship with your own party? You know, how does that play out? Yeah, and, and, and right, the filibuster, as you say, is critical for trying to understand the importance of the bipartisan nature of the Senate, right? It's because the filibuster exists that I think examining bipartisanship in the Senate is going to be a much more fruitful project than talking about bipartisanship in the House. Because at the end of the day, the House, the majority party, because it's a majoritarian institution, can enact its will. So there's no incentive for majority party members to necessarily work across the aisle, right? I mean, of course, if you're in the minority party, you'd love to work with majority party members because that's the only way that you can ultimately have a say in what comes out of the House. But in the Senate, because of the existence of the filibuster, it requires that the majority party work with at least some members of the minority party to try and get things accomplished. And right, if you're a minority party member and, and you can uh, put together a broad enough coalition, then you can still have some type of voice inside the Senate where if, if the filibuster didn't exist, there, there wouldn't be necessarily the incentive from the majority party. And so I think that it's because of the filibuster that this whole bipartisanship within the Senate is an interesting question. Now, if the filibuster goes away, then I think we lose the primary incentive for members to work across the aisle. And some people would say that's fine, right? Because that's gonna increase accountability. It's gonna make 
uh, the Senate much more accountable to people and the, and the, and the voters, and that's a good thing. Um, but it is going to it's going to utterly change the way that the Senate operates as, as an institution. Do you think that I mean, your personal opinion is what on that matter? Should they keep it? Should they remove it? Would it be better or worse? I mean, I'm torn, right? There are lots of there are lots of reasons why I think the filibuster is is a good thing. I mean, I think it, it forces members to talk across the aisle, um, but uh, it also uh, incentivizes the majority party. Or, I'm sorry, the minority party to be nothing but an obstructionist party. Um, and so, right, I sure wish that we had a, a, a minority party that was faithfully engaging in the legislative process, and I wish we had a majority party that wasn't trying to. Um, to assert its will in all sorts of um, rule changing types of ways. Um, but as long as we have the, the kind of competition that exists within the Senate today, my, uh, my fear is that the filibuster isn't, isn't long for uh, this world. And, and, and I'm not sure that would be necessarily a bad thing. Um, but before I, you, you count me as one of those people that's in favor of filibuster reform, what I'd much rather, right, a reform that I care much more about is that we start electing problem solvers to the Senate rather than problem creators. Um, and that would be my, my first objective, because if we have problem solvers in the Senate instead of problem creators, then the, they would respond in the right ways because of the existence of the filibuster. And we would have uh, right problem solving happening that would require a, a, a good share of minority party members contributing to the solution. And when we have that type of policy making happening, then we have much more durable laws. Because if, if, if we end up going the way of a Senate that looks like the House, then when there is unified government on one side, we're going to get all sorts of law changes. And as soon as there's unified government on the other side, they're going to uh, flip all those things. And we, we see this in a, in a small way with respect to executive orders. Um, and I'm not sure anyone thinks that that's necessarily a good way for, for the government of the United States to be behaving. So f we've talked about the filibuster a little bit. What about, you know, the, in the changing culture of the Senate over time, has that filtered into actual procedural changes or like hard rules that have changed because of that cultural change? Or is it all manifest through this kind of informal uh, you know, does it all just boil down to the filibuster and to unanimous consent? You know, is that it? it those are the rules that are there, They're the only ones that matter, and the culture determines everything else. Or did they tweak any rules along the way that changed the dynamic? Yeah, so you, right, you're right to point out, right, the, the UCA's unanimous consent agreements and, and, and the filibusters as being those two critical things. And those, of course, those two concepts are, are, are related to each other. Um, in what, what we've seen is certainly the, the personalities have changed within the institution, and they have tweaked those a little bit, right? So the fact that we now do much more through reconciliation, right, is 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 an affront to what what was what's supposed to happen because of the filibuster, right? The fact that um, we now ha can confirm uh, cabinet officials and lower court uh, judges as well as Supreme Court justices uh, through a majority vote instead of through a filibuster uh, proof. Uh, majority, um, right? There have been those tweaks in the rules that have changed. Um, in in right, we have a Senate today, and I think that as long as is the Senate still has the individuals that it that it seems to have, that the filibuster is going to be dead as soon as there's unified government and there's a Senate majority of 54, 55 seats. I mean, it's going to give far less power to the uh, Christian Cinemas and the Joe Mansions of the world um, if their votes aren't critical. You know, that's, I'm interested as someone who's studying the Senate for so long and has a deep understanding of it, you know, I always find it remarkable that the Senate would change the filibuster since it's directly against the interest of every individual senator. And it's really something that puts party above individual interest. Um, yeah. And uh, you would think of all institutions, the Senate would be resistant to that, that kind of change. But it looks like we're on the brink of that where a party is trumping individual uh, interest. Uh, so where do you come down on that? Is that what's happening or, or what? Oh, no. yeah, I think that's exactly what's happening. What, what the senators are doing is, is, is they're um, cutting themselves, the individual senators cutting themselves even more out of the process and, and handing even more power to their party leadership. 
Um, and, 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 and you're right. Like, I, I wish that they're right. The, the, the one thing that I, I wish that I could tell all of them is that the amount of good that you can do by getting rid of the filibuster is far outweighed by the amount of bad that the other party could do to you by getting rid of the filibuster. But of course, right, when you're in the majority party, you think that your majority party majority is going to persist. And so you want to enact your will um, uh, without regard to the mi minority party, um, not without the recognition that someday you're going to be in the minority party and you're going to be really missing some of those tools that previous minority parties were able to wield in order to ensure that the majority party didn't get to a, at least enact its entire agenda. Yeah, for the for this concept of the party interest, why is there such a adherence to this party interest currently? compared to the past, right? I mean, is it that the party controls the money for the next election? Is it because the party controls the, you know, the, the, the committee seats? Is it because they can attack the person a primary? What's the real reason that they care so much about what the party wants when you would think they have plenty of power on their own? Yeah, so I, right, I think all of the things that you say are, are, are part of the answer. And, and I think the, the bigger part of the answer is that at the same time that those things are happening is that we have an increasing nationalization of our elections. Um, so we can imagine a, a Senate that, that uh, sends uh, both a Tom Harkin and a Chuck Grassley, right, from Iowa, right? I mean, these are the exact same voters, not at the exact same time, but that are electing a pretty conservative Republican and a pretty liberal Democrat. Um, and so we can imagine states, and, and right, I was not the only one that was doing this, but what we see across time is that there are fewer and fewer states that are, are willing to send a, a senator from, from different parties to the Senate at the, at the same time. Um, and, and so what it means is that the individual ability of any one senator to try and carve out a safe space for them in order to exist in a, in a maybe a, a, a state that is a little bit different from, from their own uh, political philosophy or ideology is, is reduced. And so when you have those individual senators um, who perceive that they don't have as much power to control their own electoral fate, they end up depending upon the party much more. Um, and so we have a dependence upon party leadership to protect particularly vulnerable members from casting difficult votes. And so it, it, right, it just becomes this vicious cycle that don't make me take those kinds of positions in, in what those senators in fact are, are doing is they're undercutting themselves because they're not able to demonstrate the, the more moderate uh, tendencies that they might have because the party leadership isn't allowing them to ever vote against the interests of the party. Yeah, I think that's a, an interesting, you know, when you have the centralization of the of this national election system, as you mentioned, where the party plays a big role, um, it seems that the individual members in the senator, you know, members and senators are losing their autonomy, right, uh, at the expense of this kind of centralization. Meanwhile, people say parties are weak, which is this kind of paradox. Right. No, for sure. And then, right, I think the people who are saying that parties are weak is, is, is growing smaller and smaller. Um, but what's interesting is that the, the Senate results that we're seeing um, are so much more highly correlated with the presidential vote. Right. And so, the, right, there are a couple of times, uh, right, I mean, not the, the but I think it was 2016, where there wasn't a single state that voted for the president of one party and the senator of the opposite party. Right. And when we get to 2020, I think Maine is the only state that does that. And so the, the number of states that that are willing to even think about, right, that, that, that they have a personal affinity for this type of person, even if they're of the wrong party. Um, we just can't imagine uh, that happening uh, with a great enough frequency to kind of preserve some of those um, those traditions uh, of the Senate. So let's move on to then to the Senate uh, in the most recent memory, which obviously is the, the Trump years. You know, I think you're doing research on that. Um, typically, I'm thinking longer term about the Senate, but it sounds like you've been doing some digging on the recent history and have found some interesting results. Yeah, so again, right, this project isn't nearly uh, far enough along for me to say with much certainty uh, in, in what exactly I'll end up finding at the end of the day. Um, but I'm working with the Dirksen Center and trying to put together a, a book on how the Senate behaved during the Trump era. Um, and of course, that inevitably asks, but, but how did the Senate behave before the Trump era and how is the Senate behaving after the Trump era? And I've, uh, I'm putting together a group of scholars, uh, both political scientists and also so folks here in Washington, D.C. who are 
right? Who, who I think of as breathing the air of the Senate quite literally. Um, and I'm asking them to contribute articles on, on the various aspects of the, of the Senate. And, and I think one of the early findings that's coming out of this project is that political scientists are finding it really difficult to say that anything has changed in the Senate. Right. If we look at polarization, we see that polarization wasn't much different during the Trump era than it was before, and it's certainly not going to be that much different in, in the area after. If we look at campaign uh, contributions or uh, funding of election, right, there's not much change. If we look at the, the uh, proportion of the president's agenda that's implemented, again, not much change. And so political scientists relying upon all of these traditional measures of of uh, how it is that we characterize behavior in the Senate can't find much of a consequence to the Trump era. And as soon as you suggest that to someone that breathes the air of the Senate, their head explodes. They're like, if you think the Senate today is the same as it was six years ago, you just don't understand like what's been going on. And so trying to reconcile those two things. So what is it that the political scientists can learn from the people who are here every day? Um, and, and what is it that we should be looking at in order to, to come up with these identifiable measures to indeed indicate that the Senate is a, is a fundamentally different place than it was before? Um, and so I look forward uh, to the development of this project to see uh, where we end up at the end of the day. And, and within a year or two, hopefully we have a book out that, that kind of explores all of these um, uh, trends in the Senate over the last uh, five or 10 years. What about the Senate in relation to like its power on the treaties side of things and on, and on appointments, right? Since those are special cases for the Senate, what have you found in that regard, you know, either the Trump or before that in terms of this polarization, in terms of relationships, in terms of Trump, what have you? Yeah, what's, what's interesting is, right, the whole idea of a treaty um, is, it falls uh, by the wayside before Trump is ever elected president, because we just can't imagine on something that is fundamentally important as, as a treaty, getting that many members of the minority party going along with it to hand the president a victory. Um, and so, so much, uh, right, even before Trump was elected president, so if you go back to Obama or even uh, uh, George W. Bush or really even Clinton, what we see is that they're doing treaty type stuff through the normal legislative process, because at the end of the day, it's easier to get 60 votes than it is to get 67 votes. Um, and so, right, each time those kind of monikers that make the Senate fundamentally different than the House fall by the wayside, then we end up with an institution on the north side of the Capitol that is going to behave a whole lot more like the institution on the south side of the Capitol. Makes sense. And certainly, right, and certainly that's also true with respect to confirmations, right? As long as you needed 60 votes uh, to confirm, um, then it required some minority party buy-in. And as soon as that's gone, then we're just simply a majoritarian institution again, just like the House. Yeah. Um, so what about the concept of polarization when it comes to the general population? You already mentioned that a little bit, you know, on the state by state basis. You know, can you talk more about that issue? You know, is the general population really more polarized? And if so, is it just in response to the politics or is it generated from the, the population itself? Yeah. And so, right, the answer to your question is both. Right. So there's something fundamentally happening inside the constituencies, and that's having an effect on the institution, both the House and the Senate now broadening the, the conversation out a bit. Um, and then those two institutions are fundamentally changing, which has a feedback into the constituencies. And so, right, I can remember the first time um, when I heard an ad. Right. And this is going back, I think, to the early 2000s um, when I heard an ad in a, in a, in a primary where we were told not to vote for a candidate because they knew how to work across the aisle. And, and I remember when I heard that, I, I was like, that's preposterous. Like a fundamental understanding of Congress as an institution requires problem solving. And, and if we start getting rid of that critical feature of, of our Congress and, and we start uh, castigating people for, for doing the work that it is that we've always thought they, they should be doing, um, then we're gonna be left with an institution that's gonna be filled with people um, who uh, who aren't going to be carrying aren't going to be able to carry out the fundamental duties of their job, um, and what we've seen since then is that that type of argument has just snowballed, and and now it's on both sides of of the aisle um, sufficiently so that whenever we start talking about compromise, right, and let's take the Senate, there's 100 people, right, we can automatically exclude 20 on the left and 20 on the right, who in no way are going to be part of a, a real solution, and so now you're right talking about. A handful of people, right, that that are going to become increasingly important, and as 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 the cross pressuring of those members, right, as 
the, the, the fact that, right, that there's, we can all point to Joe Manchin because he's such an outlier and that he's a Democrat representing such a Republican state. And the closest person that we have on the other side is Susan Collins, right? And then we're talking about, right, the other cross pasture members of, of being people maybe in Georgia or Arizona or, right, uh, um, uh, Sherrod Brown in Ohio. Um, but if we go back to, right, the Senate of the 19, 60s or 70s, the the right the um, the average uh, democratic percentage of um, so the the uh, right I want to get the statistic right. So if we look at the Republican senators, the average that their states voted for the Democratic presidential candidate was the same as it was for Democratic senators. Um, and, and so it, it's easy to imagine all sorts of coalitions forming because they could be ideological or they could be because senators are feeling cross pressure and they need to do what their states want them to do. But as soon as you have the Senate equally divided between only uh, Democrats from liberal states and Republicans from conservative states, right, the, the ground for compromise uh, is weakened. And so what we have, right, getting back to your original question, is that there are some changes within the primary constituencies in, in the states, and that feeds into who ultimately runs, who ultimately wins, and then they go to the institution and they start changing the way the institution works, and that has a fundamental change then reverberating back into the constituencies, and so you end up with this whole vicious cycle where we have an extremely polarized House and Senate in such a way that very few people have the incentive to compromise, except right relying upon their like constitutional principles or what's good for the nation. But at the end of the day, right, these folks have to face their voters every two years or every six years. And so they can't get too philosophical in how it is that they behave or they're going to be out on the street. And so what do you think the media's role is in this or, you know, whether it's social media or the old school media or the political party, almost controlled media, I would call it. Um, you know, how does that play into this? Is it just, is it, is it part of the reinforcing cycle uh, yeah. where you don't have crosstalk where you used to? I mean, what, what's their role? Right. So if we think about it, there being a vicious cycle, a vortex of constituencies and members and institutions, and then on the outside, you have the social media pushing <laughs> the vicious cycle along, right? I mean, that's what we have, um, right? The, the idea of conflict sells much better than the idea of compromise. Um, and, and so we end up having people yelling at each other instead of people sitting around uh, with their notepads trying to figure out a solution to a problem. Right. Well, I think it's time for us to move on to our uh, the, the questions I ask all our guests. So later on, we can compare the answers. If you're ready to move on to the, that standard set, we'll, we'll do sure. it. Great. What do you think congressional representation should mean? Right. So. And, and maybe I'll go back to the idea that I introduced earlier with Randy Strahan, right? They're all constrained by what, what it is their constituents will allow them to do. But within that individual constraint, they're allowed a certain amount of agency. And so what I think congressional representation should be is trying to use their individual agency to operate in the most problem-solving type of way. Um, and so there, there's no doubt that some instances they have to be nothing but delegates, um, but on occasion when their constituency permits them to do so, I think acting in a more trustee kind of way with an eye towards what's good for the nation um, ought to be a, a bigger component of, of uh, the incentive structure underlying their behavior. So you say that they should sometimes be delegates, sometimes be trustees. When would those two things, when would the extremes happen? Well, right, so they have to be uh, um, uh, delegates when, when their constituents care um, and, and on issues where their constituents have a pretty firm idea of about how it is that they should behave. But sometimes on some issues, we can imagine a constituency being either evenly divided or perhaps not caring uh, as much about other issues. And so it's those types of instances where I wish that we would get members acting in, in the, what's the, the phrase, but the better side of their angels, um, rather than uh, continuing all the deviousness that, that, um, that they get from the vicious cycle that we we're just talking about. And what about in terms of who they're representing? I mean, obviously, there's the, they represent everyone in their district, uh, and then there's, they represent their primary voters on the other end. In your perspective, which one is it? And I mean, again, right. which one is it should be? This is your personal. Yeah, I mean, of course, the, what it should be is that right. The, the constitutional duty is to represent the, the people in their state, 
Um, but the, uh, the, the way that it's operationalized and, and if in, at the end of the day they want to continue in their job, they always have to have an eye towards their constituencies. Um, so right on some issues, uh, some members um, sh I, I wish would exercise more agency and in, in, on the better side. And, and I think that um, everything just becomes right this idea that right the, whenever they're confronted with a situation, they're going to act in the knee jerk. Uh, partisan way, uh, problem creating way instead of the problem solving way. Um, and so I just, I wish I could uh, instill this idea that no, like on some issues, some of the time you get to exercise agency in a good way. And, and I wish that they would do that. All right. Next question is, uh, how would your ideal Congress allocate its time? How would my ideal Congress allocate its time? Yeah, Being, and, this, and this is more between DC and the home district, you know, oversight versus legislation, this type of time allocation. I mean, right. As it turns out, because of the great broadening, right, bring us back to where we started the substantive part of our conversation. A lot of their time uh, is, is consumed by oversight. Um, and in part, um, it's because it's a lot easier to influence a bureaucrat to carry out a particular action, to engage with, with reporting in a particular kind of way than it is actually to change the legislation. Um, and so, all right, in an, an ideal way, I wish that Congress cared both about legislating and oversight. I wish they cared both about their constituents and national policy making. Um, but of course, they're all faced with these constraints. They want to be reelected, right? So that's going to require them to perhaps spend more time back in their district and less time thinking about national policy. It's going to require them to be spending more time on, on the phone and, and uh, less time talking with others, trying to figure out solutions to problems. Um, and so, right, it's, it's, I don't know, a bit fictional for us to think about or how should they ideally act when they're faced with the real constraint of their own elections. Um, so, right, again, within that constraint, with, within this desire to be reelected, I think that they could sometimes act in, in a more appropriate way, a more problem solving way, um, rather than always in the knee jerk uh, problem creating way. So you don't have a, an ideal kind of breakdown of the time? No, I don't. I mean, Right, I want them to do. I want them to do it all, but also with the idea that if they, unless if they tend to, to uh, the the folks back home, they're only going to be there for six years or two years, depending on the House or the Senate. Right. All right. Well, next question is: um, How should debate, deliberation, or dialogue occur or be structured in Congress? Yeah, and I think right, and maybe this story is becoming too trite uh, because we hear it so much since since Joe Biden has ran for president and is now president. But if, if we start with the premise that everyone inside the Senate has certain incentives and and they have uh, certain desires, um, and that all of those things aren't necessarily evil, but but rather they're responding to the folks back home and they care about certain things. Um, if, if we started off with the idea that that in fact they're good people instead of they're evil people, uh, it would be easier for them to more meaningfully engage in trying to solve problems. But if we start off with the premise that they're evil and that they're always evil, um, then it's gonna be really hard to find compromise, right? To, to, right? The idea that, that today's opponent could be uh, tomorrow's uh, teammate, right? It is almost utterly lost. Um, so people are put into, into baskets too quickly. Um, and it means that the amount of people there who are really ready to solve problems is, is, is far uh, smaller than it used to be. And, and that hampers uh, problem solving in the Senate. So when it comes to this debate discussion concept, I mean, obviously there's the floor debates, and then there's what's happening in committees, you know, and there's open committees and then there's closed committee hearings. You know, and as a study of some, someone who studied relationships, you know, would you advocate for more closed sessions where people can develop relationships? Do you think debate should be out in the open at every time for, for the negotiations? You know, how would you structure or place that debate? Yeah, I mean, right in, in the Senate, uh, right, thinking back to the institutions, right, is almost ideally structured in such a way that around the Senate chamber, there are all sorts of these hideaway offices. I wish a whole lot more was happening within those hideaway offices with senators of, of various perspectives from different parties engaging with each other, testing out ideas, talking to their colleagues, seeing if, 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 if a balloon can float or not. Um, and, and then proposing something maybe with, with the spotlight then. Um, but as long as we only have discussions happening in the public, then we're never gonna get anywhere because you're never gonna be able to have senators being able to exercise the type of freedom that they would need to in order to start solving some of these problems.
So it sounds like back to our time allocation, you'd, you'd have them spend more time on the floor and in those nooks and crannies of the Senate building. Well, right. So I'd have, have them spending more time in the nooks and crannies. I'm not sure they need to spend any more time on the floor. <laughs> Got it. Um, all right. Next one is uh, what fundamental institutional improvement should Congress make within 50 years? Yeah, so, um, in, and it's hard for, for me, right? And, and, it's, and it's, it's a cop out for me to say this as someone who studies institution, who believes in structures and rules, to then point at something other than structures and rules. But I think the fundamental problem with our system today is that the American public just doesn't understand what it is that Congress is supposed to be doing. Um, so what happens is that we have voters rewarding politicians who are uh, not only not productive to the Senate, but not productive for their own interests and not productive for the nation. Um, and so I wish that we would exercise better discretion when we uh, vote. And, and I'm not so naive to think that I could ever convince a Republican to vote for a Democrat or a Democrat to vote for a Republican. But what I wish would happen in primaries is that we would recognize that at the end of the day, they all would have uh, similar ideological philosophies, but there's gonna be some people who are gonna willingly engage with the other side. And there's some people that is gonna try to throw a bomb every instance they get. And I wish that we, the, the voters, would more often side with the people who solve problems rather than the, rather than the people who, who throw bombs. And then, right, I, I can't help but think of my own state uh, when, when I think about this problem, right? When we think about John Cornyn and Ted Cruz, we have people who fundamentally have a different way of interacting with their colleagues. Um, and, and it's striking to me that Texans at one point can choose someone who is a clear problem solver and the other time they choose someone who is a clear uh, problem creator. And so I, I just wish that the, the better angels of voters more frequently spoke to them as the curtain closed behind them and they cast their, their votes in, in primaries. Well, in order for that to happen, they have, the, the voter has to have good information about the performance of their member in Congress and what they achieved or didn't achieve. So uh, that would imply that, that you think uh, that information, which I think is not that transparent currently, needs to be made more transparent. How would that happen? Yeah, I mean, right, I think that the part of what you say is absolutely true, like, right, the transmission of information and, right, information even these days in some quarters is political. Um, but, but part of it can, can exist without the information flows. I don't think that that, right, if I talked to too many people in te inside Texas who knew both who John Cornyn were and Ted Cruz, and granted, like, I'm already shrinking down the number of people that I can talk to in my state, but I don't think there are very many people who wouldn't perceive there to be a difference in the way that those two men interact with their Senate colleagues. Um, and so, right, I mean, and, and I'm not sure how much of that was ever given to them through, right, the, a website that ranked ordered or gave them percentages or gave them grades or anything like that versus just seeing them on TV and, and what it is that John Cornyn says and what it is that Ted Cruz says. Um, so uh, I'm not sure how, how much, right, like, I mean, of course, more information helps, but I don't think that, that we necessarily have to rely on that. Um, I mean, I think that a lot of people who are making these decisions um, know full well what the consequences of their vote is. I just think they're short-sighted in thinking that that's the best vote for them to make. Next question is, what book or article most shaped your thinking with respect to congressional reform? Yeah, so I guess that there are two. Um, and one I've already referred to, uh, that's the Randy Strahan stuff, right? So that there's no doubt, uh, and especially leaders here, but we can also think about individual members of Congress, they're all constrained in what it is that they can do. Uh, but nonetheless, within those constraints, they can exercise some agency. Um, and so I think thinking about that agency and how it is that it's exercised uh, tells us a whole lot about how um, uh, individuals within institutions behave. Um, and so I think that's a really powerful book. Um, the second article, uh, and it also comes from a book, is thinking about David Mayhew, right? At the end of the day, members of Congress are single-minded seekers of re-election. So, I mean, in some circles, I'm, I'm known as, as the Mitch McConnell whisperer because I can always explain what it is exactly that Mitch McConnell is going to do. Mitch McConnell cares about three things. He cares about being re-elected in Kentucky. He cares about uh, the maybe he only cares about two things. He cared, right, being reelected in Kentucky, he cares about uh, the Republicans being a majority party. And so whenever he's confronted with the situation, 
in, 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 in part, this comes from Mahewian logic, right? He's a single-minded seeker of election. And with Mitch McConnell, I'd say, and also making sure that Republicans are a majority party. So we can't expect him to behave in a way that would be contrary to those purposes, or he wouldn't be the Republican uh, leader. Um, and so what we have to do is say, all right, so given that that's how he's going to behave, are there consequences when we can use those incentives, in, in fact, to uh, to wield good behavior instead of behavior that ultimately is damaging to the institution. And so trying to figure out those types of situations, I think we, we get a lot farther in thinking about how it is the, the Congress could again be a problem solving institution. The last question is really about your own plans. You know, so what do you have uh, in the short term you know, at the Library of Congress and what's your longer term uh, goal in terms of books, papers, research areas? Yeah, I mean, so we've already talked a lot of, a lot about that, right? So I'm going to continue thinking about uh, the social fabric of the Senate, how it is that we can measure it and the consequences that that has both on the institution and what it has on, in terms of lawmaking. Um, but thinking a, a little bit more broadly, like I want to think more about how it is that we can create uh, institutional structures that can wield, that can yield uh, good behavior instead of bad behavior, right? In, in, in good behavior and bad behavior, I mean nothing more than problem solving behavior versus problem creating behavior. So how is it that, that the institutions can be structured? What is it that we can do um, so that uh, the, the people within the institution use their agency in, in, in a good direction instead of in a bad direction? Um, and right, if I can, if I can uh, contribute some minor way to, to that which fundamentally uh, uh, has plagued the Congress over, over really um, the last 20 years, um, then I will, have, uh, I will have deemed my, my research uh, uh, agenda success. Well, Professor Thayel, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Matthew. Thanks, thanks for giving me the opportunity to think through some of these uh, questions that you asked me today. <laughs>